My dear brothers and sisters, on this very special day of Pentecost Sunday, we come together to celebrate the amazing things that our Lord Jesus Christ has done for us and the abundant blessings of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Pentecost is all about God. God the Father, who sends the Holy Spirit to fill our lives with his divine power through Jesus Christ, his Son. So whether you are new to the faith, or you have been a believer for many years, or if it is your first time hearing about the good news of Jesus Christ, I hope we all come to understand the incredible importance of experiencing the grace and the beauty of the Holy Spirit. This is the Spirit that brings new life to us every day. Today is also Baptism Sunday, and we have brothers and sisters uh, seating up here in front, and they are about to go through the sacrament of baptism, and for some of them, confirmation. This marks a beginning, right? a, a, a step forward in the lives of following Jesus. Baptism, a visible sign of God's transformative love and proof of God giving us the Holy Spirit that he had promised us. So in today's sermon, I would like to share from the book of Titus, while the text is not specifically about Pentecost, it does talk about the Holy Spirit. The text is also not solely about baptism, but it speaks about Jesus Christ and how we are united to him in his life and resurrection. Now, in the letter to Titus, the Apostle Paul speaks to the very early Christian community, reminding them about this incredible transformation that God's, bring, God, God's grace would bring to us. He begins by a vivid description of the state of our sin, right? When we were in sin, we were in bondage, and then he highlights the amazing power of God's grace that is given to us through the Holy Spirit. And so I hope you have your Bibles with you. I will, of course, put it up on the screen, and we will kind of read through Titus 3, verses 3 to 8, and then at the end, I will hope to draw some relevance of this, for, from this passage for each one of us. We begin first with this, the desperate condition of humanity. And this is a picture of who we are or where we are before God entered into our lives. Shall we read verse 3 together? At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. This is a state of spiritual darkness, being enslaved by sin, trapped in destructive patterns or habits. We were doing sinful things to one another, and we were separated with God, and we were separated with one another. Now, the thing about this passage here, the emphasis is that nobody is exempt from this state. No one is spared from the deadly curse of sin, which causes us to oppose God's will and to be in conflict with one another. And so this opening verse challenges us all to recognize our need to be saved from sin. But very quickly, as Paul paints this picture of the depravity of all humankind, he moves on to a gospel message. And here, Paul begins to describe a radical transformation brought about by God's grace. Read with me this, this verse. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared. Right, but... We were in the state of sin, but when the kindness and love of God our Savior appear. Even though we didn't deserve it, while we were still steeped in sin, God stepped into our lives out of his abundant love and mercy. He, we will soon read that he will pluck us out of sin 
when we were not in a good position to do anything about it. And there in verses 5 to 7, Paul continues, read with me. He saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Saviour, so that, having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. Quite a lot of things happening in just three verses. First, that God would perform a big, big change in all of us through the work of the Holy Spirit. The main thing I want us to note from this passage is that the transformation is God's free gift to us. And that transformation involves making us clean from all the sin that has stained our lives. So God's action in Jesus Christ for us in giving us the Holy Spirit is not a reward for any good work that had already been done. An act, this is an act of pure kindness and love, right? When God's kindness and love was made known to us, while we were yet in sin, it resulted in our lives in washing and renewal. And that's how the passage described the transformation, right? Washing and renewal, which I suppose most of the early Christians would have heard it as a reference to baptism. Right? Through baptism, through being united in the life of Jesus, we are immersed in the waters, representing how we are united in the death of Jesus and also in the resurrection of Jesus. And as we rise from the waters of baptism, we emerge as new creations. We are like new people, clean, born again in Jesus Christ. Now, the transformation that's being described here is also connected with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God plays a vital role in our regeneration and our renewal. And there is also that emphasis on God's generosity, right? It says, that he poured out on us, God, the Father, has poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Saviour. And he very generously poured out his Holy Spirit on us, taking that initiative while we had not done anything to deserve it. He has poured out the Holy Spirit into our lives to begin transformation, to empower us to then live lives that are pleasing to God. And then finally, as we look down these three verses, we see that term being justified by his grace. We, are, we have been declared to be right with God. We are okay. God sees us and that state of depravity that we were in, and having poured his spirit out on us, now God looks at, at us and at Jesus Christ through whom the spirit is poured on us, and God says, you guys are okay. You guys are good. And you are right with me. And together with that, we are made heirs of eternal life. And so there is something here about the inseparable connection between the grace that we are constantly receiving, that changing of our lives, the transformation and the being justified before God, and the hope of eternal life that all of us have been made heirs of. It reminds us of our standing before God, that we are able to stand on holy ground, right, as we had sung in the, in, in the hymn, that we can stand before God on consecrated ground and remain standing because, solely because of God's grace given to us and not because of any of our efforts. Our justification and our hope are both based on the good works of Jesus Christ and not on our own works. And so when we come to believe in Jesus, when we come to take that step of baptism and confirmation through faith in Jesus Christ, we receive the gift of justification and a very confident expectation of eternal life. 
Paul, in this book of Titus, moves on beyond that, beyond that sweet moment of salvation to the result and purpose of God's grace in our lives. Read with me. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. The transformative grace of God does not stop at personal salvation. God's solution to the depth of sin in our lives is not just to forgive it, but to transform the sinner. And so when we are saved, it affects how we live as Christians. Verse 8 encourages us to do good works. Once again, not linking good works as a currency to earn salvation, but good works that flow out of a transformed heart. And therefore, our lives, transformed lives, that display the good works of Jesus Christ becomes, will become a testimony to God's grace and become a point whereby people can see the goodness of God through our works. Now, the good works here, it's not really about just living a moral life or obeying the laws that are found in the Bible. These are good works of extending practical help to people who are in need, whether financially, physically, emotionally, or spiritually. The early Christians were known for their remarkable generosity and their eagerness to help others. As much as Christ would cross the divine and creation boundary and step into our lives and take that initiative to come and do the good works that will save us, so also we are called to be that eager to step out of our zones into the lives of other people and to do good works to help them. And so for the early church Christians, and we know this from our history books, that if somebody was ill, they would visit them. If somebody is in prison, they would drop by and encourage them. If there were people who are hungry, they would feed them. And if there were people who felt that they needed more clothes, maybe in the colder months, they would dress them, and so on. And this kind of help did not just stop short at family, but it went beyond biological family. It went beyond the Christian family to the family of all of God's created people, people from different backgrounds and religions, even their former enemies. And because these Christians had experienced the generosity of God firsthand, they couldn't help but act in the same way. Being generous with their good works flowed out of God's transformative work in their lives. And so first they received the Holy Spirit poured out generously from God onto them. And having received generosity, they extended that same generosity to others. And so if you are a Christian who believes in Jesus, and you know about the story of Jesus, and you, have, and you want to follow Jesus, and you have committed your life to following Jesus, but you have not experienced the generosity of God our Father in the outpouring of the Spirit in your lives, I want you to know that God's words here in Titus are true and trustworthy. And I say the same for those who have grown up with infant baptism, being raised in God's family by His grace that has put you here, and in your growing years, whether you're you know, still in primary school or you're in secondary school or you're you are a teenager, a youth, a young adult, if you have grown up knowing this truth, I want you to know that it is trustworthy and that God's generosity is something that you can experience. You don't have to earn the grace of God's transformation. According to Titus, you don't have to earn the Holy Spirit 
You don't have to earn the renewing and the, and the regeneration that God wants to give you. Instead, you ask and you receive and you wait for the generous, generosity of God to visit you. And so the book of Titus reminds us that it is by the Holy Spirit's regenerative work that we are renewed and justified. The Spirit is the driving force behind our transformation, breathing life into our souls, and then enabling us to participate in the generous life of Jesus Christ, in giving and doing good works to other people. In 1968, the Greek Orthodox Patriarch Ignatius he gave an amazing address at the Assembly of the World Council of Churches. And there he spoke about the role of the Holy Spirit in the church in a pretty striking and memorable way. And he begins like this. He says, without the Holy Spirit, God is far away. Christ stays in the past. The gospel is a dead letter. The church is simply an organization. Authority, a matter of domination. Mission, a matter of propaganda. Liturgy is only nostalgia. And Christian living, a slave morality. But with the Holy Spirit, God is with us. The universe is resurrected and groans with the birth pangs of the kingdom. The risen Christ is here. The gospel is a living force. The church is a communion in the life of the Trinity, the body of the living Christ. Authority is a service that liberates people. Mission is Pentecost. The liturgy is memory and anticipation. And human action is God's work in the world. Without the Holy Spirit, all the stories that we, we talk about remains God's work in the past. And the church, this group of people, this building that we worship in will serve nothing more as a monument about a God who had at some point done wonderful things. But that's not who our God is. Our God is a living God who is relentlessly driving the world towards its glorious completion when Christ is king and all creation is perfected. And this living God, as we have read today, pledges his living spirit to be our guide and to play a pivotal role in renewing and regenerating all of us and then empowering us for good works, which is the mission of the church. And so with the Holy Spirit as our guide, we as a group, as a family of baptized people, we can pursue the mission of God with confidence and urgency. We're not afraid of what lies in store for us. And so that's why many times the Holy Spirit in the life of the church is called the living force of the gospel. And it is my prayer for TA that we will experience this truth together. And so in summary, Titus 3, verses 3 to 8, tells us that God is love, he is merciful, he is full of grace. It tells us about a God who takes the initiative to intervene in our sin, sinful lives, despite our unworthiness. It tells us that God offers us the Holy Spirit, who will make the redemption and salvation of Jesus Christ applicable to us personally. Titus 3 not only tells us so much about God, but it tells us a lot about ourselves, about humanity. It tells us about the fallen state of humanity. We are described as foolish, disobedient, enslaved by various passions and pleasures. And it says that humanity begins with that terrible separation with God and with one another. However, it highlights what is potentially possible for us as people created in God's image, that we can be transformed fully by the power of God's grace, that we can be regenerated and renewed and justified and be filled with hope of a new creation. 
So what then does this mean for each, each one of us? I would like to share a few words of encouragement for you. And as you sit here, coming week after week, to honour God with your Sundays, it is because we have set our direction in following Jesus Christ for the rest of our lives. And we come with different struggles and with different victories. But I think one thing that we can know, especially for those who are still struggling with our past, is that God is so ready to forgive all of your past. In Titus chapter 3, we encounter this incredibly comforting truth that God forgives our past. He would wipe away the many sins that we have committed. Maybe just this morning before you came, you did something that you know is not acceptable to God and you come with feelings of guilt. The gospel message says that even though you are not ready, God is willing to forgive you. In his immeasurable grace, he wipes away your sins and instead of seeing you with your list of sins, he sees Jesus Christ and the list of good works that Christ had done. Christ, our Lord, would change our past by making your past part of him and that part he has nailed onto the cross. Previously, you and I were living in a state of sin and brokenness, but Jesus said, give them all to me. I am going to take your sins and put them to death. And then I am going to transform you and redeem you and offer you the complete forgiveness and reconciliation with God the Father. And so for all of you, dear friends, who will be sealed in holy baptism and confirming your baptism of childhood, Jesus is going to replace your list of sins with his lifetime of good works. Not because you, you did something or you figured something out about God, or because you thought through this, this uh, way of salvation and how the, you know, the logic behind Jesus Christ, how Jesus Christ has saved you from your sins, not because you have done all these things. You are accepted by God simply because he says so. And baptism is a wonderful illustration of absolute grace. So as you come forward later, your, your declaration is not so much a statement of your faith, but a declaration of how much God has loved you and accepted you despite your unworthiness. God is the forgiver of our past. And then there are some of us here who are struggling through issues in the present. The Christian life is not a walk in the park. For some it is, for some seasons it may be, but there are other seasons where we still remain the victim of sin and suffering. And so as we face the challenges of today, I hope we can find comfort in knowing that God is always by our side. We are united with Christ by the renewal and the regeneration of washing and the Holy Spirit and the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So every morning when you wake up, God is willing to give you his presence. He says, I am with you. My Holy Spirit is with you. You are baptized into me. And nothing that happens today can change my presence in your lives. God is our companion of the present. And so if you are suffering through some conflict in your household, God is there with you. If at night you are crying yourself to sleep because of some issues in life, God is there with you. If you have to sit through with a family going through chemotherapy, going through rehabilitation, trying to regain simple functions in life, God is there with you. If you have to go through divorce, 
broken relationships, God is there with you. It's not that he approves of these bad things that are happening to you, but he is committed to you. He will not give up on you. He will give, not give up on any of your family members who have been baptized into the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And so, if you are going through a moment like this, or if your family member is going through a season of searching, know for sure and for certain that every one of us has been etched into God's heart. And, I, and so I hope that knowing that God is our companion in the present day will give us renewed confidence in facing the many things of our lives today. And finally, God is the hope of our tomorrow. He gives us hope of eternal life, a hope that cannot be shaken. When we think about what lies ahead, I don't know about you, when we think about how the, daily, the prices of daily goods are rising month after month, we think about our future, the things that we may do, our family, our health. When we think about the future of this community here at TA, our hope lies securely anchored in Jesus Christ. Our life is destined for an eternity with God. The stormy challenges on the horizon, they may look scary, but when we come to that point, you realize that God's grace will quiet the storm. Our future has been shaped by the love of Jesus Christ. For he says, the church will be his bride and together, he will be with us as his body forever and ever. He has decided, Christ has decided to make us part of who he is. And that's why there's that analogy, the metaphor of Christ as head and we as the body. He has fused us to himself, making us inseparable from him. And with this unshakable connection with Christ, it guarantees a stable and secure future in his presence. God is the hope of our tomorrow. And so in conclusion, we see in these very few verses how God's amazing grace can change our lives completely. From being in a state of spiritual darkness and bondage, God's love and mercy intervened to bring about radical transformation. Through the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit, we are born again as new creations, justified by grace, empowered to live in righteousness. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I hope we are reminded by, of these unchanging truths about our faith, that God is the forgiver of our past, He is our companion of the present, He is the hope of our tomorrow. And by giving us the Holy Spirit, God transforms us and helps us to live today with missional purpose, to extend the life of Jesus through good works, through the gospel, to bring many more who are still in that state of sin and to bring them into the everlasting life of God. And so our response to this profound truth is to open our hearts and our lives, and to be ready and expectant for the transformative work of the Holy Spirit. That we may surrender to the, to the Spirit's guidance. That we may every day desire so much for God to give us the Spirit to lead us in all that we do. And today we will witness the act of baptism and confirmation where our dear friends will once again say yes and amen to the truth that God has been the first to work in their lives, that God has accepted you, that he has awakened you and accepted you and, and, and is ready to justify you and sanctify you before you are ready for him. 
And so we will witness this today. And for the rest of us who have been baptized, I hope it helps you to remember your baptism. So in closing, let us remember that no matter our past mistakes, our current challenges or our future sorrows, Jesus Christ will hold us fast. And we move forward in faith. As we move forward in faith, may the love and power of Jesus and the Holy Spirit continue to transform us and make us instruments of God's grace in this world. Let us respond to the marvellous work of God offered to us in Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit with this song, He Will Hold Me Fast.